Because are you wearing it? And then you can pass it out. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm, I'm was running a little late. Uh, I'm Professor Jennifer Dill. I am. Um, subbing in as the host for today's Friday Transportation Seminar. Um, I'm very excited about today's topic because I've been hearing about the work uh, that Jessica Roberts has been doing and uh, invited her to share it with us today and I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. Um, I am going to pass around for the students in the room. I'm passing around the sign-in sheet and if you're not a student, you can just pass it on. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Jessica Roberts, who is a principal at Alta Planning and Design, where she has been there for at least 10 years now. 12. Okay, it was a good guess. Um, she has done a lot of interesting work there, particularly in the area of travel demand management, which is what she's going to talk about today. So, hand it to you. Thanks so much, Jennifer. All right, yeah, so um, when I used to try to explain to my dear departed grandfather what my job was, and I told him that um, uh, my job was to help figure out how we could help people walk, bike, and take transit more often and drive in cars less often, um, he never really understood that I could get paid to do that. Um, but I think a lot of us are in the room and on, on the webinar joining us remotely because that is, in fact, our job. Um, our job is to support our cities and our communities in being better places for humans, um, and that requires perhaps a little less emphasis on being great places for cars. And there are a lot of contributions we can all make to that in policy, in infrastructure planning and implementation. My side of it is the programmatic side of it. So I work with people on various types of campaigns to uh, broadly speaking on transportation behavior change. Um, so some of you come from the TDM field, transportation demand management, some of you come from active transportation, transportation, but all of us have similar visions for how we want our places to be. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, something I'm pretty excited about, and that is, you know, pop quiz, what field is helping increase organ donation rates, uh, decrease energy consumptions, um, increase high school graduation rates, and not to paint everyone in this field as altruists, also making those social media apps so sticky that you find you've lost 12 hours uh, to them. Um, ding, 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 you read today's title, it's behavioral science. So. Um, a lot of fields are using and benefiting the insights that behavioral science brings. But I'm pretty sure having, as Jennifer said, been here for a long time that uh, the transportation field is missing the boat on the opportunities that this line of inquiry can um, open up to us. So I'm here to hopefully get you excited about what we could do if we started working in this new direction. Um, and for those of you who are joining us remotely, I just want to let you know um, that there will be some time at the end for questions, so feel free to type any questions you have into the box, as well as, of course, time for the people in the room. And I've gone ahead and uh, posted open threads on my Twitter channel, which is Jessica Roberts, the name you can't misspell, and also um, on LinkedIn, and just search for Jessica Roberts Alta. So if that's a way you'd like to engage, not just with me, but with others on observations, questions, ideas, uh, I really look forward to that. Okay, so what I'll cover today, what the heck is behavioral science? It is not a prerequisite that you know what I'm talking about, so we will get there. Uh, why should there be is relevant to your work? And I'm assuming if you're here, um, like I said, you know, your, your work is similar to mine. And how does this help us basically build a better mousetrap, build a better program, build a better campaign? So I've decided to start to jump into two real life examples, um, and then we'll back up and, and you know uh, get into the basics. But I, I think it's important to ground you in, in the type of potential that this approach has. So uh, I do not expect to read these words. This is more intended to just make um, the impact of a lot of text on you. But uh, San Jose, California, like many municipal governments, has a benefit where any city employee may receive a transit pass at no cost to them. Pretty terrific benefit. About 40% of city employees were taking them up on that offer. And they thought, oh, that would be great if more did. And here's a little sidebar. 
why do we care if more people accept a transit pass benefit? Well, there's lots of really good research that shows that access to a fully subsidized transit pass highly correlates with increased transit usage. So that's why I think it, right? Um, so the city of San Jose chose to work with a group called the Behavioral Insights Team, which is a think tank out of the UK, sometimes called the Nudge Unit, on how can we amp up the effectiveness of our communications of this program. So this was their, their starting place, the email that they would send out to employees, and the uh, Behavioral Insights Team said, okay, let's go back to research what are some good evidence-based ideas that we could bring forward and try out. That might work a little better. And one of the theories that they were working with this, was this idea called loss aversion or loss framing. And that means if I, if I give you a thing, if I offer you a thing, whatever it is you wanted a certain amount, it's free, right? Once you have it in your hand and I try to take it away, you want to keep it a lot more than you wanted to accept it. So that's the, one of the ideas they were testing. So here is uh, the new email. Again, I don't expect you to read the words, but just the visual impact should be a bit impressive. It looks a little different. So a lot of things changed. There's a clickbaity headline. What they want you to do is really big and bold and easy to see. Um, it's a lot shorter, easier to read. So there are a number of things that change, but what I wanna draw your attention to is the part that says, you're already enrolled in the city of San Jose's uh, EcoPass program, which is true. Every employee, you could say, is enrolled. They have access to it. Don't let this $770 value go to waste. Um, who thinks this was more effective? Come on, you know, I wouldn't show it to you if it wasn't more effective. Okay, I would be super happy if I found something that cost me nothing else because it costs as much to send the second email as the first. I would be super happy if I found something that was twice as effective, right? Who wants to guess how many times more effective this was? Six times. Six times more effective, good guess, 11 times. Um, again, at like, once you do the research, no additional cost. So I hope that got your attention. Uh, and I wanna give you another example. This is from Portland, for those of you in the room. Bike Town is our bike share system. And they were testing actually a number of things, again, with Behavioral Insights team. One of the things they tested was this postcard that was going out to two different groups. One, people who lived in an area that had recently received a new Bike Town station. So they had a new opportunity. And secondly, to people who had recently moved into the Bike Town service area. In this case, the people who had recently moved, the new movers, were four times more likely to take them up on their trial offer than the people who had, you know, where, where Bike Town had moved to them, basically. And the behavioral principle at work here is this idea called the fresh start effect, which says that mentally it's much easier for us to set an arbitrary thing that feels like uh, I, I'm a new person now, whether it's like, I fell off my diet last week up, Monday morning. You don't say Thursday at 2 p.m., I'm gonna get back on the wagon. You say Monday morning. Same with uh, why we make New Year's resolutions, right? It's this mental impression that like I can, I can wipe the slate clean, I'm a new person, I'm gonna try new things. So, what I hope you took away from this, these two examples is definitely not that if you send an email, you should use loss framing and that you should, if you're sending postcards, you should reach out to people who recently moved. I can't guarantee you this will work for you, uh, though those are very promising evidence-based strategies you might consider trying. The point is the method. These were people who were m making programs and wanted them to have an impact, and basically they used science. They worked with people who know the evidence that we have today to identify promising ideas, and then they tr they tested these out rigorously. This is a full, for the nerds in the room, randomized controlled trial, so they could actually know that any difference in the outcome was due to the variables they tweaked and not some other random effect. So proper evaluation allowed them to be confident that the behavioral principles they tested were responsible for the different um, effect that they saw. This is what I'm here to basically pitch you on. Um, so now, let's back up to defining behavioral science. I promised you we were gonna get there, uh, as well as like, you know, how you evaluate that. So um, economists, when they 
ask how do how and why do humans make decisions? They used to think that humans made decisions like Spock, um, that you would say, I need to, here, here are my goals, here are my resource constraints, here's my timeline, um, I'm gonna do a bunch of research and um, compare all my options in a giant spreadsheet in my head and pick the option that optimizes my health, wealth, and happiness. Um, so sometimes we make decisions like that, right? Like that's possible. Um, however, we all know times when other people, and frankly sometimes ourselves, maybe made a decision that couldn't be justified in that way. Maybe you know someone who married someone who clearly makes them miserable. Uh, you know someone, or maybe you yourself have made a major purchase that then you immediately regretted, or bought a house that it became clear you couldn't afford. You know, people who play the lottery, even though the chances of winning are infinitesimal. And, you know, I'll throw myself on the uh, pile here. I intended to start a retirement account from age 17 to like age 30, whatever, when I finally got around to it, right? That was not a decision that optimized my, uh, certainly not my wealth. So we have to develop a more nuanced understanding of how humans, not computers, not Vulcans, how humans make decisions. And that led economists to realize that they needed to get some insight from psychologists. So behavioral science, or sometimes called behavioral economics, is sort of the, the blend of um, economics and psychology around how do actual humans make decisions. And it requires us to acknowledge that Sometimes those decisions are not what we would consider rational or optimized, and that is because our brain takes shortcuts. So let's talk a little bit more about the shortcuts. It is not my fault that I have to start with system two. That is economist, very famous uh, economist Daniel Kahneman's fault. Uh, but we have two systems in our brain that I want to talk about. The, the one I want to talk about first is system two, and it is your Spock system. It is slow thinking, deliberate, takes a lot of effort, um, logical and it feels like thinking you know it is like your conscious act of thought and we use this to make some of our decisions so, so one of the things is you know if i ask you a complex math problem what's 24 times 17 most of you in the room can't just tell me what that is you have to really think about it um, maybe if you're deciding which mortgage company to go with right you might do a bunch of research if you're planning an overseas trip you got to make some decisions probably look into your options. Some of you maybe decided to attend college in this way, really considered all of the options and did a bunch of research. It's also what we used when we learned to drive. If you recall, that was really difficult. You were really straining to remember what, what happened when, right? Um, so some of our decisions are made using that, that system, the, the slow thinking system. However, some of, in fact, arguably most of our decisions are made by the other part of our brain, which is called system one. It is the fast system. It is automatic. It is subconscious. It works on autopilot. It is intuitive. It takes shortcuts. And actually, most of our daily life, we don't perceive that we're making decisions because this brain is, is doing all the work behind the scenes. It doesn't feel like thinking. Um, it kind of happens in the background. Uh, so maybe if I say what's two times two, it, contrasting with our other math problem, you didn't have to think about that, you knew the answer. Uh, I contend that some people probably picked their college not on a fancy optimized spreadsheet, but rather because their dad went there, or because it's a city that seemed cool, uh, or because their boyfriend or girlfriend went there. Um, that's an example of a mental shortcut that people use to make a pretty important decision. It's also what you use when you're driving, um, once you've learned to drive you get from place A to place B and you sort of couldn't tell yourself how that happened. It just sort of happened without your conscious thought process. So that's, that's your, your, your fast thinking system. And I want to make really clear that it is not necessarily an inferior system. It is highly adaptive. We don't have the brain power and the time to treat every single decision in our lives with like the full firepower of your slow thinking system. So this shortcut taking brain is working hard to save your brain for when you really need it. So there are lots of times when these shortcuts are really adaptive. Um, you, you get a good outcome. If you're at a restaurant and uh, you don't feel like reading the four page menu, you might just ask the waiter, uh, what's the most popular thing? And you'll probably get something that's pretty good. If you're at a rental car desk and you're in a hurry and they say, well, which of these five sizes of rental cars do you want? You're not gonna sit there and calculate the cubic you know, feet of the load you're gonna carry. You might just be like, I bet medium is not too small or too big. 
those are reasonable ways that our shortcut brain serves us. But when we make decisions that really would have been better served by our slow brain using our fast brain, sometimes we come to suboptimal outcomes. And I think that's, we can argue, often the case for transportation decisions, certainly in North America, where the very strong default is drive everywhere all the time without thinking about it. So my fictional example is someone from Phoenix, picking on the people from the Sun Belt, sorry, who moved to, let's say, the inner east side of Portland, um, and first day of work, just drives to work because that's how you get to work. It was not a decision um, that was made consciously. Paying out of pocket to park, but I guess that's just what we do, right? So um, what I want you to take away from this is that almost all of our behavior change campaigns are trying to appeal to the slow thinking conscious brain where we're trying to win people over on the basis of uh, economics, like cost savings, or um, uh, speaking to policy, or, or um, environmental goals, right? Or like uh, capacity, we, you know, we, we need to preserve capacity in our roadways. That might work, but it takes a lot, a lot of work. I think that we would be better off focusing a lot more of our energy on how can we work with the shortcuts that people already have in their brains. So the example would be for this Phoenix commuter who moved to Portland. I could spend a lot of time on him trying to convince him of how he'll save money and feel healthier and you know, save the environment by getting out of his car. But what if I just told him, did you know that 75% of your colleagues don't drive to work? That would be activating what's called social norming. And um, there's a lot, a lot of evidence that um, feeling out of step with the norms of your community makes people uncomfortable. They probably wouldn't admit this to you um, because you know we don't succumb to peer pressure, but uh, actually maybe we do. Um, so that might be enough to motivate this person to try something new. And frankly, I don't care if I convinced him about the rational benefits of not driving to work. We got to the same outcome by working with the mental shortcuts that he carries around in his head. So that is what I hope um, we can do more of in, in my work and in, in whatever role you play in this. So um, I wanna tell you specifically about a little bit of research I got to do for TransLink in Vancouver, BC. They are both the regional transit agency as well as the um, regional transportation demand management group. Um, and they have made a lot of investments in high frequency transit service around their region and very wisely, and part of this is because they had a senior leader who had come from the UK where behavioral science is highly embedded in government decision making, say, how can we make sure we're maximizing the ROI of these very expensive transit investments we've made uh, using behavioral science? So, the goal was to figure out how, how we could use behavioral science to um, understand why people, oh, I'm on my next slide, to understand why people are driving today and also how we could use the same insight into influencing their travel choices to, in their case, specifically get them on transit, but also active transportation. You know, we're all friends there. So, um, I got to work on the project as a transportation demand management practitioner and specialist, that was my role, and we also brought on behavioral insights team because they are the ones with the Harvard PhDs in behavioral economics and a knowledge of the literature as well as how it often gets applied in governmental programs. Um, so we did a lit review, which was um, one of the first to say, how can we apply this to transportation? There's not a lot out there that is specifically already about applying behavioral economics to transportation. We found a handful of studies, share them with anyone. I've got them in a Google Drive. But a lot of it was us making our best guesses about what is transferable from other fields. Um, and then we did a workshop with the agency decision makers to learn more about the kinds of problems they were trying to solve, the opportunities that they had. And then we did not do, but we drew on market segmentation work that TransLink had already done. So our results will be presented based on that market segmentation. Um, and I want to be really clear that what we came up with is strong evidence-informed ideas that still need to be tested. These, these are not best practices. These are not promises. The, but these are really promising ideas that now all of us um, should be figuring ways to test out and report back. So 
The first market segment we called try it again. These are people who have taken transit. They, they maybe do it one to three times a year, you know, maybe that one big parade or whatever, um, where even they are like, okay, I don't want to deal with driving and parking. So we know they technically have access to transit and know at least somewhat how to use it, but it is not a habit for them. So the first question, how can we understand um, what shortcuts in their brain may be leading them to drive instead of take transit? Um, the first one would be the status quo bias. It's always easier and more comfortable to do what we're already doing than make a change. And now that you'll understand about the slow and fast brain, you'll understand why, right? It's a lot easier to just, you know, fast brain do what you always do rather than really engage your slow brain and think through trying something new. That's related also to the idea of cognitive load. So trying something new requires that you, you do a lot of processing. It may even be go and get new information, but some of it simply may be thinking through how to do something new um, that is effortful and sometimes uncomfortable for people. We also know people have what's called ambiguity aversion. And that uh, that is sort of like better the devil you know. So this means that um, risks that you understand are more comfortable to you than risks that you don't understand. So anyone who drives regularly knows that it doesn't always work out. There can be unexpected traffic, there can be you know, uh, construction you didn't know about or uh, a, a marathon that you didn't hear about. I mean, you don't always get where you're going as quickly as you thought you were going to, but you're, you know what the worst case scenario is and you've probably dealt with some of those issues, even a flat or running out of gas or something, you at least know how to solve that problem. If you are not in the habit of doing something else like taking transit, um, at some point, again, this is totally subconscious, but there's like, I don't even know what bad thing could happen and I'm definitely not prepared for it. And then finally, the halo effect is a principle um, that says, you know, if there are people you admire or, um, that you see yourself in who, who do something, they lend some of their sort of personal credibility to you to that activity is like why, why sports uh, stars are endorsers for products, right? But unfortunately, if you have a negative association with people who are doing an activity, then um, by association, that activity um, is not appealing to you. So in a lot of places where I work, people who never take transit, for example, think that it's gonna be filled with smelly people. So you hear this really a lot. Um, or, you know, maybe it always breaks my heart to hear this, but I work in some places where you hear that, oh, well, people assume that if someone's biking, it's because they lost their license, because they, they got a Dewey. If that is your impression of who does those activities, you don't want to be associated with it because people might think the same thing of you. So those might explain why this particular audience continues to drive. Um, let's talk about what solutions might be appropriate for this audience. One is the idea of the timing of the nudge. Um, maybe if I have some way of engaging you, we don't have to deal with what that is yet, but some way of talking to you about getting to work by transit. And I choose to do that on, I don't know, uh, Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Maybe that's a good time for you. But I can't help but think that probably Sunday afternoon at 4.30, might be a time when you are more ready to receive a nudge and think about new information. Maybe if you're planning to, let's say, bike to work, set out your stuff for the next day or make a plan for the week. So the timing of when we engage people can be really important. Um, reframing ambiguity. So getting at the ambiguity of version, I think there might be a promising line of inquiry around, um, especially in places where the bike infrastructure is good and or where transit has uh, priority, so priority signals and priority lanes, to frame those modes as the reliable time modes. So, um, and then driving is that you never know how long it's going to take. So stimulating ambiguity aversion around all the bad things that could happen for your drive. Um, I certainly know that for my bike ride home, it doesn't matter whether I feel like I'm really tired or really peppy, it's like plus or minus a minute um, in how long it takes me to get home, it's really highly reliable. So no guarantees, but it, it might be worth testing out. Uh, another concept is foot in the door. You already know this, it's like, you know, first pass free or whatever, you know. Once someone takes a small step, they are much more likely to take the next larger step. 
Um, and some of that is because people don't like to be intellectually or identity-wise inconsistent. So once they've done something, they somewhere in their minds start to think of themselves as a person who blanks, person who does blank. They obviously they are, they did it, right? So why wouldn't they do the next thing? And so that's why you know all of these bike town and all the scooter companies make it so easy for you to try the first ride, um, usually free and and uh, as as easily as possible. Um, there's also really good research, some of it coming out of PSU actually, around um, showing that people who uh, walk, bike, and take transit um, see their their commute or their travel time as having a really positive utility for them. So that that time is their exercise time, or it's their de-stressing time, or it's their me time, where they get to like, you know, if they're on the bus, maybe that's when I get to knit, or that's when I get to read a book or listen to a podcast and nobody bugs me. Um, so I think kind of getting at loss aversion, if we can start to tell stories about the, the positive benefits that people receive by doing these other things versus driving, which is straight up lost time. It's lost to you, it's lost to your family, it's lost to your hobbies. I think that's worth testing out. And finally, simplifying the experience. I mean, some of this is just straight up like UX, UI kind of best practices, but whatever it is that you're asking people to do, make it easy for them to do the thing you're asking them to do. So you already saw in that example from San Jose that you know the really big blue like click here to sign up for the program, it was easy to figure out. And hopefully once they clicked on that link, it was also very easy for them to you know, do whatever it took for them to receive the pass in their hands. I think a lot of us, we're all dealing with the change behind the sofa cushion, curtain or uh, cushions level of budgets, right? So I have a lot of empathy for that, but a lot of our programs have like, let's say, you know, interfaces and sign up forms and making a new password and, you know, just like a very high level of um, work needed to finally get to the point where they sign up into our program. So anything we can do to make that easier uh, will um, make it easier for people to follow through. All right, our next market segment we called Make It a Habit. So these are people who, um, they use public transit like maybe two to three days a month. So they've obviously figured out how to do it. We don't have to worry so much about that like ambiguity aversion. You know, they, they, they successfully use public transit. Um, and they're interested in using it more, but they're obviously not really doing it much. So some of the things we think might be at play for this group is something called mental accounting. So maybe, for example, um, if you have sort of a, bu a, a bucket in your head of like what certain types of activities reasonably should cost you. Let's say you drive downtown on the weekends to go shopping or meet your friends, go to the farmer's market, and you have to pay out of pocket to park. But that, and, and maybe you wouldn't do that for certain other types of trips, but that just feels like, oh, that's a reasonable part of what it costs me to go socialize with people. If we can help people reframe like what it's what that mental accounting sort of wallet should contain or how else they can use that money, um, they might be willing to revisit how reasonable it is or how much they want to be spending that money on parking. And then also affecting everyone who owns a car, right? Is sunk cost effect. Uh, unfortunately, the um, fixed costs of car ownership in North America are very low compared to the variable, or are very high compared to the variable costs, which are very low, right? Like gas doesn't cost you that much. A lot of places you don't even have to pay to park, but you've already paid for the insurance and you're paying for the car every month. So you have this idea that, like, I have to get my money's worth. Um, so we think that really factors into why a lot of people drive. Some of the solutions for this audience would be to invoke the power of defaults. So this works in almost every field. Uh, if you go to sign up, let's say for a, your work has a retirement program and they, you have to pick different like programs, you know, the index funds or what, you know, whatever the higher, lower risk and all kinds of different programs. If they're just presented with none of them checked, then, you know, you have to make a decision. If one of them is checked, but you can totally change it, you're way more likely to pick that option. Uh, so in this context, we were thinking of it in terms of the transit card. Uh, people can get a transit card in Vancouver, BC, just like we have here, the hop fast pass. So trying to make it so that when people register the card, there are certain things checked by default that they can certainly uncheck if they want to. But for example, the auto top up option. 
So basically, if your card is connected to your bank account, it can never like run out, right? It'll just always, you'll, you'll be able to just keep using it and that will lower the friction in the experience for you. Uh, we thought about evoking identity. I already told you about how, how people want to be consistent in their identity. So if we can start invoking for people that like, oh, well, I see that you take transit regularly. It's great that you're a green commuter or a healthy commuter or whatever it is that our research tells us is related to how that person views themselves. I'm not saying those are the right words, but you know, create um, a sense of like, oh yeah, I am that thing, or I aspire to be that thing. So um, one of the researchers we worked with explained it this way, that when she goes to talk with her toddler daughter um, about maybe cleaning up her toys, instead of saying, do you wanna help? She says, do you wanna be a helper? So that, that's what we're talking about here. Another uh, concept is called increasing salience, and that is basically like people are busy and distracted, how can you get their attention? So there are lots of good examples. That email I showed you was addressed by name to the person that was receiving it by first name. That is a way to get people's attention, even if it's just a little bit, or increasing the salience of the ask. So you, you saw that also in the example about making it a lot easier for people to just literally figure out what you want them to do. So whether this is about messages or, or the click we want them to take or you know what, whatever it is that we're trying to get put their attention on, there are evidence-based techniques to um, make that stand out more or increase the salience. We already talked a little bit about the power of invoking social norms. It is one of IMHO, the best tested tactics out there in very many fields, uh, but especially energy conservation, and, well actually, and um, get out the vote. Um, probably other things too. Uh, very, very, very well established. But the caveat I have for you is that you cannot lie. And um, of course we know that if you go off of, let's say you wanna talk about like, do you know how many people bike in our community? If you go off this, uh, the census, like commute to work, you're gonna be like, did you know 5% of people bike? And that's not motivating to people. In fact, that communicates pretty powerfully that you are out of step with the norm in this society if you are not in a car. So do not despair. I think there are ways for us to frankly be creative about how we slice and dice the numbers that are available to us, ask questions of people. There's something called, um, uh, dynamic norms, which is not as well tested, but has some evidence around if you can say um, twice as many people started biking last year, you know, I don't know, to PSU, we'll see next year. Now that uh, Bike Town is free for PSU, we may start to see some really impressive numbers. So if you can say there's sort of like a trend that you wanna be a part of, even if we're not yet to the point where we can say eight out of 10 people do this thing, you can have aspirational norms around maybe if you do some surveys and say, you know, nine out of 10 people want to walk and bike and take transit more, you know, you can start to reveal norms that you can use. Uh, but again, they, they have to be real. And finally, something called implementation intentions, and that's getting at what's called the uh, intention implementation gap. So where someone already wants to make a change, um, but, they, but today's never the day to get around to it. So my example, my embarrassing example for myself of always intending to start a retirement account and taking so long to do it, it was just like, well, I'm, I, I'm tired. I'm just gonna watch a TV show instead of research retirement account options today, but tomorrow I will do it. So there are lots of good strategies to, um, to help people get to where they wanna go. And the best is, or certainly the most prominent is called action planning or again, implementation intentions. And that's where you walk, help someone walk through like literally every step it's gonna take them to do a thing, like make a little mental movie for them of themselves successfully doing the thing. And by thinking through that, they also have to anticipate some of the decisions they will need to make. Um, so a great example is that if someone calls you up, um, I know Oregon's a little different, but bear with me, uh, and says, oh, it's election day on Tuesday, are you gonna vote? And you say yes, and they say cool, and hang up the phone, it, there's almost no impact on the likeliness that you're gonna vote. But if they say, oh, cool, uh, which polling place are you gonna go to? Oh, the one down on Franklin, cool. Um, are you gonna go before work or after work? What, what time of day? Oh, 7 a.m., great. How are you gonna get there? You're gonna drive there. With someone? Yeah, you and your husband? Okay, so it sounds like you and your husband are gonna leave your house at 6.45 to be at the polling place on Franklin by 7 a.m. next Tuesday on your way to work? Great, thanks so much. You're much more likely to do that. 
you now understand you've just made it a lot easier for your subconscious fast brain to you know execute that program you wrote for it uh, instead of it being effortful slow brain in the moment And finally, the third market segment, we called this use it well. So these are people who are already taking transit four to five days a week. I'm assuming they're the, that person who always takes transit to work and never takes it anywhere else. I, I know, you know plenty of those people. Um, we didn't really see that there were barriers to this group using it more. We saw it more as opportunities for them to be messengers. Um, we know that there are, there's a lot of good evidence that uh, behaviors travel in networks. So if I lose or gain weight, the people in my network are more likely to do the same thing. If I increase or decrease my, my activity level, start smoking, stop smoking, these things are infectious. So you know, seeing these people as ways to access their network. So our goals for these people were to increase their enjoyment and satisfaction with the experience of taking transit. In some ways, I see this as a car purchase prevention program, right? And to recruit them as ambassadors. And so some of the specific ways that we thought of this, um, I don't like this idea, this next one, but I have to accept that, uh, you know, if there's good evidence for something, it's worth testing out. So I'm trusting our scientists. There's a lot of evidence that shows that no matter what people say, and even though we all go around with our earbuds in, in public all the time, and especially on public transit, that they end up being happier when they connect with other humans. So they came up with the idea of like a conversation car on a train where you go there and then there's some sort of prompt that uh, stimulates you to have a conversation with a stranger. I don't know, but <laughs> it would be a very interesting test. And the point, the, by the way, the point is that, you know, I'm trying to model for you that we shouldn't always let our own personal opinions um, dictate what we think would be successful. If there's good evidence, then we should be willing to try things out. Another is referral programs. Of course, we all think about these all the time, but exactly how shall we implement them? And um, one of the thing that's, things that's on my mind lately is what is the motivation for people to participate in these? Um, and maybe, you know, what's the moment when we ask them to? What's the salience of the ask? There are a lot of ways that we could make these systems easier to say yes to and um, stickier. Uh, in some place, in many actually cities, um, there's a big problem that if we want people to start taking transit in particular, often the transit system is basically maxed out during rush hour. It really can't fit any more people. And I'll just say, you know, a little like note from the peanut gallery is that's one of the um, reasons that bike share and scooter share can be very, very complementary to transit because it can help bleed off some of the peak demand to leave it for people who do not have those options or feel comfortable with them. But that's not behavioral science. Um, so there has been some work done uh, in Singapore in particular, and I think BART in the Bay Area is trying this out too, to create some like gamification and reward programs that help encourage people to travel off peak to basically spread the peak of um, transit travel behavior. And honestly, they told us in Vancouver, BC and TransLink that people literally, if they left their house like 10 minutes earlier could sit and as opposed to like leaving their house during peak have to stand and you know you'd think that would if people knew that maybe it would be compelling and finally getting back to reframing the value of commute um, as we talked about earlier really you know focusing on either making it more pleasurable or um, fulfill you know your your goals and needs or just making people aware of the way that it does that so that the, that was the result of our research um, and now the question is, you know, hopefully TransLink will run with this, but how can the rest of us benefit from it? So I am actually going to, I'm gonna skip ahead, just so you know that this will be available to you later. These are um, some resources available to you to educate yourself more about these concepts. And if you are in a position to start playing around with them, um, get help. So one is a link to our report. Another, there's this wonderful thing called edX, which is like free online university courses taught by, you know, some of the leading experts in the world. And they have a great series of like behavioral economics 101. Um, and then also there's this group called Ideas 42 that has an 
A-B testing module that can help you if, if you are like sending two emails and you want to figure out um, if you have enough statistical power basically to, to you know, d discern differences in the outcomes. They can help you uh, design your A-B test. Um, and then there are some research resources that I already told you about behavioral insights team. There's the Bloomberg What Works Cities Initiative, which has some behavioral science components built in. Uh, there is the Behavioral Insights Group at Harvard, and they have this interesting thing called the Mayor's Innovation Project. If you work for a city, I, I, at least in the U.S., I, I don't know if Canadian cities are eligible. Um, this is an extraordinary opportunity to have Harvard researchers help you, I believe at no cost to the city, uh, design and execute behavioral trials. Uh, run, don't walk. Um, there's a group called BEAR, I forget what that stands for, but behavioral something, 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 at Rotman in Canada that's doing really interesting work. And then there's JTL at MIT. Um, so these are all, you know, if this is interesting to you, go follow them on Twitter or social media of your choice um, and start to, you know, engage with the research that they're already doing. So with that, you know, that'll just be, we can, I guess, send that out or it'll be on the recording. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go back now to what maybe will stimulate the most discussion. I, I know this is a lot of text, but the one in the, the two left-hand columns are just all of the things we just discussed about the TransLink report. I just put them up there to remind you. And then I want to bring forward a few other concepts that um, have come up in some of the other research work I'm doing that I think are really promising. Um, I will explain them to you briefly, and then I'd love, I mean, whatever questions have come up, I'll take them, but I'd really love to know what that I've presented to you got you really excited and how, you know, what do you want to test or what ideas came to you about like, oh my gosh, I feel like I could use that or that makes a lot of sense to me. So a few other, I think, highly promising and well-tested behavioral strategies, the idea of making a public pledge. I was over at the Portland Bureau of Transportation the other day and I, I saw that they had up there like my, my green team pledge and, and people could write on cards and put it up for their colleagues to see that they had committed to a certain action. Um, so, like I said, people want to be perceived as consistent with the commitments that they've made and the values they claim to espouse. So uh, public pledges can be really impactful. Uh, playing around with when people are extrinsically motivated and intrinsically motivated. So, for example, we often assume that people will only do a thing in exchange for like a thing, like if you sign up for this program, I'll give you a coffee card, right? Or you can earn points that then you can redeem for something. So that would assume I, I, I want something for myself, extrinsic motivation. But I think we haven't played around very much with intrinsic motivation, like maybe if I do a thing, then I get to pick, um, there's a charity of my choice that receives a donation. Or um, maybe I get to just sort of like enjoy being the fairy godmother who like gives transit passes or, um, you know, bike share passes to people that I meet, right? Projection bias is an idea that a, a different Harvard researcher I work with is very interested in, and that's the idea, um, well, her example was like right after you participated in Sunday Parkways or an Open Streets event, if someone comes up to you and says, do you want to ride your bike more often? If you just had a great time, you might be like, yeah, I totally do. Uh, maybe we can use that for good. Maybe there are moments when people are feeling more jazzed about walking, biking, taking transit, and we can engage with them, maybe have them make a pledge that then they later feel they would like to be consistent with. Personal challenge, this is one that could backfire uh, really spectacularly, but I'm still curious about it. There's a lot of research that's been done in government recruitment, especially around recruiting more diverse candidates to apply for public sector jobs, and in particular, um, police jobs in the UK. And they found that, um, the, what we would all assume is that talking about like, you can serve your community, this like, you know, um, public motivation, doing good would be the most effective. But they actually ended up finding that stimulating people's sense of personal challenge was significantly more effective. So challenge yourself um, was an effective message. And I find myself wondering if we could do something around that, especially if people are feeling motivated to become more physically active. Uh, loss framework, which we talked about, fresh start effect we talked about, and then messenger effect is related to who is inviting someone to participate, and if that is someone who it has status or, um, you know, in some way is aspirational for the person receiving it. 
Okay, we'll stop there. We've got 16 minutes for chatting. Jennifer, did anything come through from on the yeah, webinar? I'm okay. Yes. So all of these ideas that you discovered and figured out how they could relate to transportation, um, were you able to test any of these uh, for transportation situation yet, or is that the next step for the or translate? TransLink is still figuring out if they're ready to do a test on this. Uh, that was the original goal, um, but they've had some big changes, so I will have to see what they do with this information. Um, I know, well, I shared with you the San Jose and the um, Bike Town tests, and those are some of the only ones I've seen that are directly in this field, and they were both done through the Bloomberg What Works Cities initiative. Uh, because like behavioral insights team sort of comes to cities as a package. I do know of some tests that are going on right now, um, but I can't, this is one of the things I'm learning about working with academics is that they need to be a little bit secretive about the research that they're doing until it's been published. Um, they'd like to be open source about it, but they also have to be careful and make sure that it ends up being like publishing worthy. So is that, did I say that correctly? Yeah. So I know that there's some interesting things in the works right now um, that I think within maybe 12 to 18 months, we'll hear the results of um, that are very exciting. And I do also know that the state of Connecticut is doing a test for their statewide TDM, Transportation Demand Management Program. So it's aimed at major employers and trying to, their, their goal was to get more major employers to sign up for the program. And they decided to work with loss aversion frame. And in that case, they went and did a bunch of research about um, monetizing the benefits the productivity benefits for employees who work at employers that offer transportation benefits. And so the loss aversion pitch was, you know, your, basically your competitors are getting more productivity out of their employees by offering these services. Uh, the results of that should be out very, very soon, I hear, but um, haven't been published yet. Those are the things I'm aware of. Um, if you find anything else, though, let me know. Um, and yeah, I have some more ideas, but I uh, haven't found a funder yet, but yeah. The conversation card? <laughs> yeah. Did that actually happen, or is that like an idea? Or oh no, like these were all, you know, promising testable ideas. Yeah, okay, so no, no like one's doing that yet. Time of that happening or like no, that you wanna do it? <laughs> 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 well, it's interesting, I mean, some, some of these things, might provoke backlash, and that's one of the reasons you have to measure properly, because it could be that the things we're doing today and not evaluating are actually not only not effective, but working, you know, having a negative effect. There's also the situation um, that sometimes things have a backlash and are still effective. So there's a super, super famous study in the voter turnout arena. Um, that shows that the single most effective thing we can do for voter turnout is to send every single person a letter. Your voting record is public file, so not for whom you voted, but whether you voted. So if I sent you a letter that said, what's your name? Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Um, here's how many times you voted in the last four elections. You voted two in the last four elections. Uh, the average on your block is 3.7. We'll check in with you after the election to know, let you know how you did compared to your neighbors. It was super effective, and people hated it. They hated it so much that it actually can't be used. Um, so they've had to come up with kind of kinder, gentler ways to implement that that are not nearly as effective. So keeping in mind the backlash to, isn't identical to it not working. But. Yes? The idea of having the voter identity and values, um, I feel like Portland has this strong <coughs> bike savvy culture where you can kind of bike and you can kind of let people know I bike a lot and I'm really good at it. And I, whenever with transit, <laughs> I I try to like ambassador and, and it's frustrating my friends basically say the negative behavioral effect. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I just don't know, I'm curious how 
there could be like a, a transit of the identity that's um, esteemable, admirable, um, without without characterizing like I'm a bus driver or a bus rider, like I have a past. Mm -hmm. That's about the only accessory you need to do it, which is great, but it seems um, like I don't know if somehow tying transit savvy into like general street smarts could be um, motivating for mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Uh, I know what you mean very uh, intimately because I often am responsible for designing and running programs that are fully multimodal, meaning I'll help you do anything but drive alone. Like, I really don't care. Like, what do you want to do? And we do a lot of guided, fun themed walks, and guided fun themed rides, bike rides, and then we try to do the same thing for transit and people just don't show up. Like I don't think there's the same sort of like um, association with it as being like a lifestyle aspiration or you know something like fun and cool or maybe even something that people feel they need help with. Um, so I, I, I believe I understand what you're talking about. Um, I, I think this is where consumer research is, is what would answer your question and find out if there are people for whom perhaps, you know, being multimodal or leaving, not leaving the car at home, maybe being active. I think a lot of, well, there, there's lots of good research that shows that people who use transit are more physically active than, than those who drive because you walk on, you know, both ends of it. You might be more likely to walk or bike during, during midday. So I think that this becomes like a, you know, a research project where you try to find out if there is an identity that at least some people who ride transit espouse that could be aspirational. Um, and if it isn't, then you work with something else, you know? I, I do, I, I keep asking my, my researchers, you know, my research partners, like what's the cutoff for social norming? Because I'm personally really enthusiastic about the channel cards that TriMet, our transit agency puts up that say like 45% of downtown commuters travel by transit. I feel like it's always the same number. I, I totally believe them, but it's randomly always the same number. Um, you know, go to Timbers games and what, I feel like there's a third one too. And PSU, that's right, yeah. And I always feel like, wow, that really starts to feel like this is not a marginal activity. You know, this is like obviously highly accepted, but I don't actually know whether 45% um, stimulates a norming response. So I'm still trying to get that answer. But, but it's, get, it's starting to get there, right? I mean, that is not one in 10. Jessica, do you better capture the audio in the room? Could you unclip your microphone? Yeah, okay. of course. Okay, thank you. Which way does it go? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jennifer, do you want to take more in the room? Or? I'll, I'll do one from the web. Um, and I'm going to expand a little bit uh, on the question that they asked. And it, Professor it's, Prerogative. This <laughs> issue of time. And um, in the research of your work with the um, other researchers, uh, could you address the issue of sort of how long it might take for someone to yes. change behavior, but then the issue of sort of maintaining the behavior? Oh. And the things to think about with respect to time. I don't know the answer to that. I thought you were asking me a much easier question, which was like, how long would it take to do a, you know, a test like this? Um, I, I am sure that there are people who have studied this. It is not something that I have yet researched in detail, but I will call out that one of the reasons that transportation behavior change is so difficult is that it's not something you do once. And so much of the research around using behavioral economics to achieve, you know, pro-social outcomes is related to one-time action, sign up for green energy, register to vote, low flow shower head, insulate your house. Um, the, it's much easier to help someone do one a one-time thing. That's something that is a habit, especially when that habit is, you know, somebody said to me recently, like, you know, driving is the easy button. We've built our societies and, and our economy around that. Um, so I think that um, it is important to acknowledge that these habits are very it's going to take a lot of effort and time to change them. Um, I mean, you've done some research on the longitudinal effects of like well, smart well, trips. I'm wondering if, um, and maybe we don't have time here, but it's interesting to think about some of these methods up here, which one of them might be particularly good at reinforcing yeah. to sustain the change over time. Right. Some might be good for that initial 
get someone going. And then right. Maybe one productive uh, sideways answer is that um, I've come to think in my work that we should be focusing a bit more on that, uh, supporting people in trying a new mode for the first time. Uh, I think we undervalue that and we jump so quickly to like, well, if I don't see that you've made a permanent, you know, meaningful vehicle miles reduced impact at the end of my program, then I haven't been successful. And of course, that is what we want in the long run. But I think we should, at a minimum, from an evaluation perspective, be daylighting the moments when people, you know, that's our foot in the door, right? And we know that it is quite challenging to try something new for the first time. And so I think we should we should celebrate that, but also figure out, like, maybe differentiate programs that aim at that or the strategies that can support that first time action from the ones that are working more on making it a habit and making it, you know, easy to sustain over time. Anything else from the webinar? Or? I'll let okay. go next. All right. uh, go ahead, Lou. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, from a neighborhood here, uh, consider the, uh, the attitude towards transit as hostile. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that. Um, do you have any uh, take on different regional attitudes? Toward, you must have different approaches towards advocating transit in towns like that. It was, this is in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. mm. Hi. So the question was, what do you do if you're in a transit hostile environment? Um, uh, I don't know what the immediate answer to that should be, but a couple of things come to mind. One is that it's really hard to market a product that sucks. Um, so maybe, you know, at some point we have to focus on the fundamentals of like, is it a reasonable option for people to use that? I mean, it becomes a chicken and egg thing, right? Like, but if that's the actual problem, then a marketing or nudge approach is not the right fix. Uh, so that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, another is that um, I think we could do more to identify the people who are interested in change and work with them first, instead of trying to work with the general population always. Uh, let's see, I had another idea, what was it? Um, oh, yeah, just like amusing thing. Um, I do find myself, uh, oh, I know what it was. I, I think I think you're t thinking a little bit more from an advocacy perspective, and I think that's where a, a different line of message testing comes through. And maybe later we can talk about a really great project that the League of American Bicyclists did around micro-targeting to identify the um, demographic profile of voters who would be more likely to support transit and bicycling um, ballot initiatives. Um, I think it was really incredibly smart. It's like kind of related to, but not identical to, to a behavioral economics approach. Um, so, talk later. Let's see, yes. Um, I'm curious whether you have any research behind behavior change as it relates to age, um, whether what, which ones might work better for children or what programs, like, you know, say, across the school versus, or even just removing barriers to entry, like, you know, I'm seeing increasing number of older folks on bikes because there aren't e-bikes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what, you know, what, what should these methods might tie into um, mm -hmm. behavior change. Okay, so um, which of these might, might work for different ages to summarize in case you couldn't hear that. Um, there's no reason to believe that these behavioral principles are different for different age groups or demographic groups. So that's the st where I would start. This is like hardwired into our brains in terms of like wh where evolution landed us. So from that perspective, um, nothing's off the table for specific audiences. Um, to answer the specific question, that doesn't mean they're all like going to help you accomplish your goals. That's where a part that I didn't really take the time to focus on, but if your goal, if you're starting with like, I wanna make a program that accomplishes X outcome in Y community, you really need to start with ethnographic research where you, you, you know, do trip shadowing with people and have them tell you about, you know, how they felt and what the decision points were and um, do what's called a journey map where you actually like map out uh, people's behavior and the decision points along the way where they could be influenced to make a different decision um, and then, you know, focus on learning as much as you can about each of those like friction points and decision points. Um, and that's actually the basis where then you turn to the literature and you say, okay, well, this is this is the, you know, the the 
behavioral step, like like there's this journey map that's that's quite long and you need to narrow in on something that's sort of bite sized and say, this is the part of this person's decision making process that I want to influence. And here's what I've learned about their barriers, their beliefs, their values, um, their decision making um, you know, the basis for, for how they're ending up where they are. What behave, well-tested behavioral principles um, might apply here? And, I, you know, I don't know if there's evidence out there that we could use based on like Safe House School versus seniors, uh, but that's where, that's where you'd start. So it's not the short answer, but I think it's the, the process correct answer. And we have to wrap it up, yeah? Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So come, come talk to me on Twitter, please. <laughs>